Amen. Because it's right in what Jesus taught. Amen. And so we actually walked you through a bunch of amazing concepts, amen. Actually, in, in our PowerPoint that we shared with you uh, last week, actually, if you can uh, pull that PowerPoint up just for a moment, we'll pick up with what we had here in slide number nine. I was able to finally get it on this thing here. So come on, somebody. It's next level time. Boy, you ain't ready for me, boy. I didn't got the PowerPoint working. All right, so we were on slide number seven. Okay, now I know the slide number. Well, come on, somebody. All right. And we told you that the word, when we go to 1 Corinthians 14, which I'm going to show you here in just a moment. So first, first make sure you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You can read along with me in your devices in the KJV or the AMPC. And we're going to walk you through some of the language that the Holy Spirit uses through the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Let me also say this. People have often used Acts chapter 2 by itself to interpret the beauty of this gift available to all believers. But how many of you know the laws of hermeneutics say you don't interpret one passage in and of itself? That's incorrect. The way you interpret that passage is you study systematically from when it's introduced, and we showed you it was introduced in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and when it's introduced, what did the Bible say? That there were different Diverse kinds of spirit language or tongues. Diverse kinds in the Greek literally means different types. Say different types. Okay, it's important, okay? So then he begins to walk you through 1 Corinthians 13, and I love that because what people have neglected to help us understand is that he begins to purify our motives before we start moving in power. 1 Corinthians 13 is all about that your motive should be to love God and love people, to hate what God hates and love what he loves. And that, that doesn't just include hating sin and hating things that destroy people spiritually. That includes hating sickness and any form of demonic bondage that also destroys people physically. And so he walks through that, how the importance of love is so critical in all that you do, then picks right back up in 1 Corinthians 14 because he didn't really change the conversation. He was introducing the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, ensuring the purity of our pursuit for the power of God was not to make ourselves look great, but to love Jesus and love the people for whom Christ has died. And then he begins to explain how all these amazing different types of gifts, including spiritual language, can be expressed with excitement and be embraced in a public assembly. And the whole chapter is not a censorship of the gifts. I gave you an example last week. There's a difference from, uh, uh, there's rules for football, rules for basketball, and there's a difference from somebody coming in with an official's whistle and a referee saying, hey, listen, we're going to have a lot of fun today. I just want to make sure that you understand the rules and, and how it works, and then we're going to have each person play a role, and we're going to have a great time. There's a difference from that spirit than somebody coming out in the middle of the, a basketball court, snatching the ball and saying, game's over. And many have falsely presented the heart of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul in this chapter as censoring and denying the expression of the nine gifts of the Spirit, and very specifically, praying in your spiritual prayer language and the other expressions that are involved, and they believe that chapter is about censorship. But it's not true because Paul speaks about in that chapter not to forbid, and I'm going to read some of that here in just a moment. Okay, so here in 1 Corinthians 14, we'll get to the slides here in just a moment. I'm going to pick up back where we mentioned how. Um, first, let me read this to you. When you look at Paul and Luke's presentation of praying in your heavenly prayer language, because I mean, you know the first expression is through Luke. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Then you have the apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit who gives us explanation of its expression when you start going into the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 14. And he begins to kind of speak about these different expressions. And of course, many of you don't realize that the Corinthians believers were a church lacking in unity, but were insisting on being uniform. But how we showed you and how the Holy Spirit began to show us that God is a God of diversity. He likes difference. He likes to express gifts and even creation, even the melanin human beings have. We don't all look the same. God loves diversity. He loves difference. Amen? 
And that's why you have to be able to understand it's not a strange thing for God to have multiple types of how one gift can be expressed. Just like we saw uh, multiple types of the gifts of healing, multiple types of the working of miracles. Matter of fact, three of the groups of the gifts that are mentioned are pluralized, meaning there is multiple different ways God expresses those particular groups. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we begin sharing with you how the number one way you see that this gift is expressed of decoding the language of the Spirit and why the primary emphasis is the personal private use for prayer available to every believer is because it's the language the Holy Spirit employs through the Apostle Paul here in this chapter and many other verses that we walk through. The first verse we showed you is in 1 Corinthians 14 in verse 1, which says, Eagerly pursue and seek and acquire love, and make that your greatest aim and quest, and then earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual gifts. So as you can see, what I told you was true, because he begins going back into the gifts and says, Now that I taught you that your motive should be love and not just power, love. He said, now I want you to desire, now I want you to hunger for God to use you in the gifts because now you realize motive is more important than just manifestation. Okay? Motive is very important because I'm going to tell you this as Christians, it's an amazing thing to say, God, I want you to use me to pray for the sick and heal. That's not even evil. But the Bible says if you want to play the long game and have longevity when it comes to integrity, then you have to purify your motives. And it's got to come up higher than just wanting God to use you. I want God to use me to prophesy. Not evil, but not the highest motive. I want God to use me to pray for the sick. Not evil, not the highest motive. The highest motive is Jesus died on the cross to remove sin, and he was filleted and brutalized to also destroy the source and the origin of sickness and oppression. So you have to love God with all your heart. And, I, and this is why the greatest commandment in Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 says, love the Lord your God. Why is that more important? And I said this before, you can't love your neighbor. You can't define love by what is expressed to a neighbor if you don't first learn to love God the way he requires you to love him. So if God has a standard of love for himself, he also has a standard of love for your neighbor. And loving your neighbor is not just giving him a shirt and a bowl of soup. That's an aspect of it that many of us have comfortably hung our hat on because it takes pressure to push ourselves to mature to say, you know what, when someone is dealing with pain, it's good to give them Bengay, it's good to give them aspirin and bears. I just want to bless you with a bottle of Tylenol, but I see you suffering, I'm praying for you, I'm your boy. Hey, I'm not my, it, it, whatever people, but we have cut ourselves short from the standard of Christ-style ministry because Jesus never proclaimed a message that he did not couple with the miraculous or manifestation by the leadership and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Could it be we're not fully loving our neighbors if we cut the expression of Jesus' character short only to a message without manifestation? Is it possible to tell people Jesus rose from the dead? Here it is. Our whole foundation of Christianity is built on a supernatural event. No, no, no. It's built on, 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 on the Sermon on the Mount. No, 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 no. All scholars across all disciplines say if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it's all a lie. So the hinge wasn't just a message. It was a supernatural event that centers around our faith. No other leader rose from the dead. So don't tell me the supernatural is not important to a God who is a supernatural being, who is not a human, who lives in another dimension and realm, and he desires to express himself supernaturally through his people. Amen. Now think about what I just told you. Your whole faith centers around the supernatural, but you censor the supernatural. Actually, Satan laughs because it levels the playing field and puts Buddha on the same level with Jesus. Krishna, an everywhere leader. 
Because now Jesus just becomes another religious voice that becomes an option. But who is he who calls fire from heaven? Who is he when his name is invoked? He's not just saving and cleansing the sins of people that we can't see. Who is he who's, who cancer shrivels and dies when his name is invoked and his people believe? Who is he who still raises the dead and casts out demons by the finger of God? Who is he who walked on the shores of Galilee and walks in downtown Atlanta today? So we must be able to deal with the pressure of maturity that says, I have to master how to preach the gospel correctly, but I also got to put pressure to have intimacy with the Holy Spirit because he doesn't want me to just talk. The kingdom of God is not just in talk. Didn't the scripture say, but it's in power. Well, you do half the job you have to do witness and arguing with people. If you say, hey, hey, before we even get into that, by the leading of the spirit, you always check inside and say, you know what? You have any pain? What's going on with you? Well, you know, actually, you know, I'm going through a rough time right now. You'd be surprised. It isn't just clothing and feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. It's part of it. But what do you see in Jesus' ministry? Because you represent his name. Amen? We're not going to be able, just because the standard is going up and the pressure to mature and leadership rises, we're not going to dilute that standard. We're going to have to cry out and seek God and let the Holy Spirit tell us, okay, you're serious about being 100% a witness for Christ? A true witness who doesn't just speak like others, but actually is able to bring the power of the Spirit of God into a room, into an environment, into an atmosphere? Then I'll start teaching you. And then definitely he's going to go to our character. He's going to go to our motives. He's going to go to our love of, for God and our true love for people. And when you're able to be discipled by the Holy Spirit, it has nothing to do with God so sovereignly selecting one to move in it or another. It has to do with your ability to sanctify and consecrate and love people enough to deny yourself so God could be expressed through you with greater intensity. Amen. Hallelujah. We will not be just a word church who loves theology. I mean, you know, I teach theology all the time. I had to help teach y'all to love it too. But we are not just going to be talking heads and we don't pray and do any of the other things you see in Jesus' ministry. I told you, at best, you are a 50% effective witness for Jesus Christ. There's no question about that because the standard is for Christian means that you are in the downline of your founder and he never spoke without doing. So that means you have to pressurize. You have to accept it. Y'all play football and basketball. And you need to step up. You need to get your, get your head in the game. Yes, coach. Yes, coach. <laughs> well, let me coach you up in here. It ain't enough, especially nowadays when they're in the street flipping the bird and dancing naked in front of our kids and telling the church we're coming for your children. It's a Philistine spirit. That is mocking and challenging the powerless church. What you going to do? Nothing but talk and sit in a building. See, see, you got to get fed up. See, you know, God, God will start, you start getting God's attention. When you start purifying your motives and loving him and saying, God, I love your people. And then I'll tell you, one of the first expressions of love is anger. No, it ain't. The Bible never calls anger sin. The Bible says the wrath of man, man does not produce God's righteousness. But you cannot, the most powerful emotion second to love, and I believe it's an expression of love when it's by the Spirit, is a holy indignation. A holy indignation, different than human fallen anger. A holy indignation says, doggone it, they should not be having to put up with this. 
Jesus died on the cross, not only for their sins, but for their body. They should not. And see, now something starts stirring in your spirit that never stirred before. God, I, these people should not be dealing with this oppression. When you died on the cross, not just for their sin, but to restore their authority in Adam. See, you start getting the Holy Spirit's attention when you start to see what angers you often becomes a clue on something God created you to solve. Part of that commission is you preach the gospel and you believe through intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And this gift is one of the only gifts that we can document in the New Testament where you can make a decisive decision to facilitate intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Second only to studying the Word of God. You don't find it. Now, we can invent stuff if you want, but this is what you see. Amen? And so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2 says, He who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men but unto God. Now, I want to show you something on this slide. Go to slide number, number 10. <laughs> you know, I'm proud of myself. You know, I'm technologically challenged. I never told you that I was perfect now. Don't judge me. Okay. Now, we have the scripture on the screen, so they're going to toggle a little bit. So be patient with them. But I want to show you something. When it says, he who speaks in an unknown tongue does not speak to Ben, but unto God. I want to give you a little more clarity to show you it is not a human language because of what this literally means in the Greek. It literally says... The word used right there is anthropos, and it means a human being. No, no, pastor, this is German. Now, this is German. It's supernatural, but it's German. It's German, so people can go to Germany. No. So as to include all human individuals. How many of you know if it means, so in other words, the, the verse can literally be translated, he who speaks in an unknown Spirit language, this is the personal prayer language. Why? Because Paul gives us multiple details about it in this one chapter. He said he's not speaking, literally can say, to any human being. How be it what? In the spirit. Go to the next slide. In the spirit, literally pneuma means the Holy Spirit within him. This is how it's used. In the spirit, I'm, I'm in verse 2, y'all with me? It means by the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit, co-equal Father and Son, the spirit, the vital principle by which the body is animated. So this is why in the Greek it's often translated as the Holy Spirit by your human spirit is praying. The Holy, say the Holy Spirit by your human spirit is praying. Now, this is powerful. Go to slide number 13. And he goes a little bit more when you look into vines and look at some of the, the actual study resources. It says, belonging to the divine spirit or emanating from the spirit, this is often the Holy Spirit, to exhibit its effects and so even its character. It literally says here on the bottom, I have it highlighted, the acts of a life dedicated to God and approved by him due to the influence of the Holy Spirit produced by the sole power of God himself without natural instrumentality. What's the last word say? Supernatural. So now it's the Holy Spirit. Praying by your recreated spirit, that already tells you, it already shows you in the word. If you don't partner with the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of power you'll never walk in. It's already inferring and showing you. If it's the Holy Spirit, it doesn't just say the Holy Spirit just does it. Holy Spirit, through the, your human spirit that he recreated, which you have a conscious choice to release, that again shows you. Many of us said, Pastor, it didn't happen because God didn't want it. Wrong. It didn't happen because it wasn't the Holy Spirit's will. Wrong. The Holy Spirit, God has designed you 
by him living inside of you is to have you are to have intimacy with him and it is not just him but it's in partnership with your spirit recreated in Christ you have to yield your spirit to release his intercession and that will make the difference and it could be the margin of failure or success in the life of a Christian. Now that's right there in the Greek. Now I want to show you a little more here. Are you, are you with me today? I didn't come to play with you now. I came to teach you the book. However, in the spirit, what does it say here? The rest of verse 2. Look in your Bible. Let's continue in the verse. In the spirit, he utters secret truths. Once again, showing you it can't be another language because you're not uttering in a spirit language secret mysteries and truths. And the language means spiritual. How I many you know when people talk Spanish, German, Creole, whatever they talk, it's not supernatural secret truths in the spiritual realm by the Holy Spirit? All right. I want you to see how folks lie on the Bible. Because there's people who are double theologians than me and they ignore it. I've asked them the questions. They just go right past it. Because when you have an idol of intellectualism, see, this is why I keep telling Christians, they can't stand this gift. <laughs> and I say, you know why? Because you're intellectually idolatrous. You can't understand why your brain is not the boss. But here it is in the life of the Christian, the Bible teaches you your brain was never the boss. The Bible tells you to renew and renovate your mind. The Bible tells you that to be carnally minded will produce the death nature in your life. Everything of the human mind, the brain is not the mind. That's the organ that holds your, your mind. Your brain is your thoughts and your values and how you think and your logic. And the Bible even says that is also part of what the scripture calls the flesh. See, the flesh isn't just the body's appetites, instincts, and impulses. That's one part. But it partners with an unrenewed mind. And they work together as accomplices to produce death in your life. So, of course, God needed something to work on the mind-to-mouth connection. He needed a supernatural supplement, a technology. To help that mind and help that mouth. And through a conscious decision. That's why this is not something that you, this first expression, the personal private prayer language available to every believer, is not something as the Spirit wills. You don't see that language in the New Testament. He speaks in the affirmative as if all can do it. Why? Because you have to make a conscious choice to trust Holy Spirit within over your mind. And it makes you more inwardly conscious that he's in control, not your thinking. That discipline alone in the life of the Christian can determine how you see everything in culture. Wait, 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 wait. I see this, this racially. I see this. Issue. Wait a minute. I'm about, to fl- I'm about to black out. My mind, my, it went through my eyeballs, into my brain, my background, my upbringing, my ethnicity, everything. I'm about to, I'm about to be triggered. Because this is what I know, what I see. Wait a minute. Mind to mouth is arrested by the indwelling of the Holy Ghost who can speak to your spirit and say, wait a minute. Before you believe this, before you speak on this, before you commentate. Let me tell you what's really going on behind the scenes with this. And you was like, seven cuss words on your mind, every four letter word in the book. And you was like, Holy Spirit's like, I saved you. You was about to violate me. Violate me and the whole kingdom you represent in half a second. Now, you're on slide 14. Let's move quick. We're, we're, we're breaking this. I, I need you, man, because I'm so tired of the lies. And every Christian who falls because of half-sanctified teaching... Because you're afraid of the supernatural or you refuse to study without bias. Folks are wondering why they ain't got no power to overcome homosexuality. I ain't got no power to stop smoking weed, Pastor. Ten years I've been to church, I'm still living the same way. I just learned to say hallelujah, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, Holy Spirit, come. 
And then the devil comes right in because you half presenting the martyrs, half presenting the empowerment that makes you a true witness from the mouth of Jesus himself in Acts 1 8 and Acts 2 4. Then the devil could come right in on that half representation and say, because Christianity ain't real. We were given to given it by slave owners and all these other unclean apologetics. And now next thing you know, folks is deconstructing. They're like, you know, I'm gonna try something else. Look. Yeah, I've been in church 20-something years. It ain't do nothing. For... You know when something works for you. Let it be a face cream. Let it be a dog on toenail clipper. You be on the, you be on the internet talking about, y'all need to buy this. Huh? I couldn't get these deep yellow calluses off my, on these scaly feet for, for years. And I just I found this cheese grater. This cheese grater down in, 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 in Target. I tell you what. When it works, you can't keep your mouth shut. So what does that say of American Christianity? If people can deconstruct, well, it's the falling away. I believe the Bible does prophesy. The Lord says there will be a falling away. But what about some of that falling away is because we have given people 10% juice, 10% real New Testament Christianity, 10% of the real biblical Jesus. And guess what? If we could alter it and change it however we want it to be, God would have allowed us. But if there was an image that had to do with a message and the miraculous, it had to do with an individual and manifestation, if there's a hunger not only to be saved, but a hunger to be empowered, and there is witchcraft, shamanism, and all these other myriads of unclean demonic forces, but the church is to believe we have nothing but the living God who used words to create worlds, who speaks and his mouth constructs everything that he speaks in an entire supernatural kingdom from Genesis to Revelation. Not one page hardly doesn't have some crazy supernatural intervention from a supernatural God. But we are to believe that we should be happy with our Bible and stop being sensationalists. While the Wiccans are telling you, now come on, give me one of his hair. You, you like that guy? Give, all I need is to give me a cup. That he drank from. If you can get one of his body hairs, that's even better. I'm telling you because this is my family. And, you know, if we get a body hair, matter of fact, you know, within uh, a few weeks, you'll be sleeping with him. And it works. You know, I tell you, my cousin was a a satanic. uh, uh, He actually knows the guy that y'all love. They're actually real good friends. Um, What's his name? See... I'm trying to get John Ramirez here. John Ramirez, right? And they were training him in in dark arts and witchcraft. He's actually going to be here in a couple weeks. Maybe I have him share his testimony. And he said, you know, it works. They're training him. You can sleep with any woman you want. Anyone I want. All you got to do is get a glass. Go in a bar, get a glass she was drinking from. All of this. Man, that's not fair. (laughs) You were born into sin. You're a spiritual death zombie. You have no covenant with God. You have, no, you're no, you have no match for the supernatural realm without the blood. This is a supernatural world living unseen in the template of a physical world. There are beings everywhere. Stranger things. That's why I used it. <laughs> so, 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 and you know what got him saved? The satanic priest. The satanic priest said, the only thing it don't work on is, is, is Christian women who, are, and, and, and who speak in tongues. Told him, a satanic priest who speak in tongues. And he said, and he just kept going and teaching them the rituals and all that. And he said he couldn't get that out of his mind for weeks. And he went back to his satanic priest and said, why don't it work on Christians uh, who, who speak in funny languages? And that's what he told them exactly. He said... Because Jesus is real stupid. <laughs> Told my cousin Petey, <laughs> the satanic priest, Jesus is real stupid. Who you think we fighting? What he told. He said he could not get that out of his mind. And he was into dark arts. And he kept hearing, because Jesus is real and you can't do it. On God's people who speak in funny languages. The satanic priest 
told John Ramirez, John Ramirez said he could see in the spirit those who had the second experience had a flame on their head all the time. Not when they first received. All the time it was a And he said, when he saw them with that, he said, you couldn't do no curse, no incantation, nothing. But he testified that Christians who didn't have it dealt with curses and dealt with witchcraft. I'm just telling you what he said. I mean, you can cross-examine him when he comes. That's on you. But in the spirit... He speaks mysteries. Now, watch this. In the what? He speaks what? Now, here's what that means in the Greek. Hidden things, secret mysteries, confided only to the initiated. There are levels of communication Holy Spirit can't have if we don't fully obey the process. To the initiated, a hidden or secret thing, not obvious, to the, a hidden purpose or counsel and secret will. So when you look, when he says in the, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries, he's telling you it's hidden and secret things that God will confide in you if you will become initiated into this second experience. There's no other way you can have it according to what you see Paul teaching. You can't make nothing up. It's right there in the Bible. You can't experience it without what he's talking about, which is praying not to any human being of any earthly human origin, to God. Then he says something about how purposes and counsel is wrapped in the term mystery. So when people say, when you pray in the Spirit, you're not just Building yourself, you're actually, you're actually tapping the purpose of God and the, count, the secret, hidden counsels of God. For who? For your assignment, for you personally, for the place he's placed you. For the kingdom of God, the more you use, in a region. Is that all, all part of his purpose? All part of his counsel? Now, I want to show you. Another Greek theologian, he, he gives an amazing summary that I, I, I put in here. Go to the next slide. This is so powerful. He said, now, it, it's an entire study in the word use of mystery throughout the entire New Testament. Look what he says here. Man, I almost threw the book across the room. He said, it is God who reveals mysteries and has made known what will take place. Now, he's talking about the use of mysteries through the entire Bible. Then he begins to talk about the Hebrew word counsel, counsel, secret counsel, 22 times. Look at the highlighted part here. The word is used in the Old Testament of a heavenly counsel. What have I been teaching you all about? Composed of an assembly of angels presided by Yahweh. To the secrets or mysteries that were decided at these heavenly councils. No, this is not just a Pentecostal commentary. Look at the name. If, well, you, you don't care. Okay, he's not the Pentecostal. Okay, so prophets were allowed to see these heavenly assemblies and the decisions rendered there. Thus, the Old Testament refers to a concept of mystery as divine secrets that can be known and understood only if God reveals them to his people through a prophet. But here's the difference in the New Testament. Because the Spirit of God indwells you, every believer in the least, has the access that an Old Testament prophet had. And people get nervous with that, and I understand, because there's a goofy prophetic apostolic movement going around today. Not all of it's not goofy, but there's a particular brand, and they get on my nerves. Everybody is not in the office of the prophet. But you have, because a prophet in the Old Testament, prophet, priest, king, and judge, had access to what? To just whatever they want, to tap the counsel of God's mind that he created for his purposes and wisdom. That's how it's used throughout the whole Bible. And that's the same word used when you're praying in that prayer language in the verse. That's the exact word used. So he's telling you, who cares if your mind don't understand it? You better get over your intellectual idolatry. He said, I will transport you to the, my spirit will transport you to the council of heaven. 
Stop me when I make it up. Watch how I pull all the vocabulary from what I just read to you. Transports you to the heavenly council where God is secretly decreeing and declaring and making moves with his counsel and purposes, not only on earth, but with his heavenly sons. And because you yield to that, you transport immediately into the Congress of heaven. You transport into the very presence of God, and God says, oh, you're using and obeying the technology I gave you? Come forth, my son. Come forth, my daughter. And the secret things, that's many of our problems. You're frustrated because it's a secret to you while you're single. You're frustrated because it's a secret to you while your marriage is not improving. You're frustrated because it's a secret to you while you're broke and you can't do good with money. You're fr- because some of it's trauma. It goes deeper than just the physical body. There is spiritual forces at work. And you need the mind of God. See, and I love God because he says, you know, I'm not going to let you get around me being supernatural. I'm going to put a gift in the mouth of every one of my sons who believe and obey, and that's going to be how you get the highest counsel. Which shows you again, I am a supernatural God. I didn't birth natural children, and I'm a supernatural God. I don't care what goofball preaches you opposite. Let's go to the book. Now, Now, I'm just angry for you. I'm not angry at you. I'm just angry for you because you've been robbed. I'm not. Pastor, you got an attitude. Yeah, I do. I got an attitude. I do have an attitude. See, because I want you to walk in everything God has for you. Now, go to the next one because there's another portion here. It just gets better. Go to the next slide. See, it says, divine mysteries as hidden realities which are prepared and kept in heaven, and disclosed and shown to the enraptured seer as he wanders the heavenly sphere under the guidance. Now, that's the Old Testament usage. How you in the New Testament, we're not seeking angels and wandering in a weird sphere, but that's what the usage of it was. How of you, now that you have the Holy Spirit, you're not guided by an angel? Who guides you? God himself. That's why it's called the better covenant. Establish on better promises. Now a high priest, even the prophet couldn't go behind the veil. Now you behind the veil, talking to the Ruach. My son, we got problems all over earth. What you need? I need the knowledge and the wisdom. Say less. Watch this. The concepts of mystery as used in these sources are more or less similar to the New Testament use of speaking divine secrets are known only by God and to those to whom he chooses to reveal them. Apart from God's revelation, it is impossible for human in the next parts of understanding. See, and I told you, one of the reasons is that God doesn't let you understand what's going on when you're praying in your personal prayer language is because the whole kingdom of currency is your confidence in God's character and not contradicting his word. So this gift, people want to mock, is the cheat code of the Christian, where when your brain is catching up to the Bible, your, the Holy Spirit can still pray properly through you consistently, and you are not contradicting the word, and you can't doubt what you don't know. Did you hear what I just said to you? That's my favorite part. You can't, how can you say, oh, God, you can't use me to do that. You can't use me to go to nations. You can't, what? You know who my daddy is? You know who my mama is? You must be crazy. What, did, what do we see in the life of Gideon? The angel appears to him and says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of courage. You know he ain't courageous. He's literally hiding in the wine press. But he spoke the characteristic of God. God doesn't speak. Death and darkness when he sees it. He speaks the opposite. Light, chaos, come into order. So the angel comes and says, I don't care what your external circumstances look like. God has called you to actually not only be courageous, but you're going to be one of the most courageous warriors in Israel. And what does Gideon do? What we all do? I'm the least in Manasseh. And you know Manasseh and all that either, angel. Did you know about Manasseh? We broke, we ghetto. Nobody wants to be. See, that's why I didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, because he came from Nazareth. That was like the Jewish hood. True story. 
And what did he do? He started complaining because he was looking at his earthly identity, all his physical limitations. And what he was doing was contradicting what God was saying. The Bible says God became angry at Moses. And, and Moses was saying, I can't talk. I stutter. Send someone else. I don't, and most of us would be like, man, wow, Moses is so humble. He's not out here strutting like I could do it. The Bible says it angered the Lord. Angered the Lord. Why? Because God is saying one thing and Moses is contradicting him consistently with his mouth. And God is like, you boy, ooh, I'm the brains of the operation here. I'm the miracle worker. I'm the one who's going to do it. <laughs> I can almost see it like, oh, no one's asking you to do now. I'm going to put the ability in you. Send someone else. How'd they lose out in the promised land? They, they, they said what it was. Giants, grasshoppers were not strong enough to overtake them. They didn't lie, but in the spirit they lied. Why? Because they contradicted that God put a spirit of victory, and it was really his ability that brings a victory, not their inability humanly. So God said, for every witness of doubt will be one year of wilderness. Don't tell me Christians are goofy because we confession and we watch our words and we shouldn't declare and we profess and proclaim and blab and grab. You talk however you want to talk and you can be disinherited. I'm going to be careful with what I say and I want to try to say what the word says and I'll tell you what, that's better ground. They will call Christians cultists who believe in confession when all of Christianity is built on confessions. The Nicene Creed, the Antinicene Creed. Oh, confessional, just take A-L off of it, confession. As a Christian, you better watch your mouth, and this gift will help you. Watch your mouth. This gift will help you speak in a language that you cannot use profanity in and release the heart and the mind of God. Man, I've prayed in tongues angry. I've prayed in the spirit upset. <sighs> I don't, how have you been trying to tra train a child or raise a kid or you have a teenager or how have you know anything that is a mystery feels like a wall in our life we can't get around? And anytime we hit walls, what do we do? We get mad. This gift is helping you by the mind of the spirit. Now, I want you to see that. Now, 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 let's go back to where I was because I got to hurry up. Okay, so the five dynamics we see in the personal prayer language, the, the verses that Paul uses is chapter, verse 2, 4, 14, and 16. Those are your main texts in this chapter that give us a detailed description of what the personal, private prayer language of every believer does. And the reason it's totally different is because the gift expression has different rules, like one for basketball and one for football. It's a total different expression when I go to the next one. So the dynamics were what I told you, man to God, you speak mysteries in the spirit, Oh, wait, wait, I got to show you this. Oh, my God. I got to show you this really quick. <laughs> Go to my last two slides, uh, Simone. Now, drop to verse 4. He who speaks in an unknown tongue, what does this say? Edifies and improves himself. Watch this. The word edify literally means to build a house. To erect a building, to restore, to, re to repair. Remember I told you demolition, renovation, flip my house. He is also telling you, he's not only talking about prophecy and other gifts, he's saying your personal prayer language does this with you. And then now when God wants to use you in a group, with a group of people in an assembly, it shifts more to a prophecy uh, that gives a message in an understanding way to the people. This is all he's talking about. That's it. Not all the extra confusion. But look, to, and look, the word also means to promote growth in Christian wisdom. Affection is a synonym for love, grace, virtue, holiness. See, see why we keep falling left and right, but we've been saved for 27 years? Is it just studying the Bible only and hearing sermons? No. It's your personal intimacy with the Holy Spirit, and nothing in the New Testament says you can facilitate that at will with intensity and growth but this gift. 
Challenge it. Prove me anything in that book. Challenge it. So now it's not just for miracles only and signs and wonders, right? It's for Christian growth and wisdom and affection and grace. So that means if this is already in you by the person of the Holy Spirit, using that gift releases the wisdom. Using that gift releases the affection of God, Jesus, in you. Using that releases and unfrustrates the grace of God in your life. Using that gift gives you virtues and values and character. Using that gift can get you over the hump of holiness where you're stuck on something that you can't get past. Using that gift releases the Barak, the blessing. This is not a denominationally uh, slanting uh, commentary. This is what it means. So now, when I tell you, when you pray in your spirit, you're building the inward sanctuary of the Holy Spirit, I've proved it. It means, go to the next one. It gives you a little bit more. Very quick. i got to hurry up. The word orkodami, when it literally says edifies, is the word orkodami. Literally means, the root is oikos. Oikos means house. It literally means home. O-I-K-A-S home. Well, who lives in you? Who lives in you when you're born again? So you got a house that ain't a home. But I thought when Jesus destroyed my sinful nature and removed it out of me, yes, you're saved. Yes, you're loved. Yes, you're a son or daughter of God. None of those other attributes fade away. But we're not going to devalue the importance of this gift because those other realities are true. There's something you could be missing without it. So if the Bible says it is, even the word edify is where we get the word edifice, to build a building, to build a house. It means architecture, a structure. So that means that your spirit can be clean and clear of sin with no renovation. It can be a flipped house with no furniture. Holy, using this gift changes your body from just the housing the Holy Spirit into customizing it through intimacy that makes it a sanctuary and a home for him. This gift is disparaged. It is mocked. It is swept under the rug. And people have said, where's the power? I mean, some people, even when they don't care about miracles, they say, where's the transformation? Where's the Christian character? Well, for sure, 50% of it comes through this. For sure. Outside of being born again and understanding the word, you don't have anything at will that can facilitate a building project in your soul. That can renovate. Is this too deep for you? Are you catching this? See, some of you as a pastor, I've tried everything. You know, I always ask people, have you gone on a fast and prayed in the Spirit every day? So I'm not just telling you pray in the Spirit and you don't talk in English and say, Lord, I thank you for this day. And We already walked you through verse 16 and said, I will pray in the understanding and I will pray without the understanding. I will sing in my understanding. I will sing without the understanding. The versatility to give. You know, people will tell you that when you counsel them. I'm not saying anybody here in particular. And then I ask them the basics, but, but are you fasting and have you prayed in the Spirit until you've received the mind and the counsel of God for your situation? Well, you know, I mean, I work, Pastor. Okay. Pastor, you know, I got a job. Who don't have a job? I'm so tired of that excuse already. Who don't have a job? See, because we, what, what we end up having to do as preachers who are unspiritual or don't teach you. See, there are spiritual preachers who won't teach you this. Never on a Sunday morning. You can forget it. Now we got to be Holy Spirit Junior because we don't value what he said as a person in, in his process for empowerment, his person process and of empowerment. Now we got to step in and do stuff that he would be doing. And so now we're running ourselves ragged. Why are pastors committing suicide? Why are they dropping dead like flies? Why are churches closing? 
I'm not saying it's because they don't pray in their heavenly prayer language, but at the same time, I am going to be saying that there's such a power in it that whatever human ability cannot be accessed to shepherd, to be supernatural, and supernatural is needed. I I can't just read books to find out what's going on. I need God to tell me what this person's issue is. I need God to say to me, son, don't don't even, that's not even it. Don't even study 77 hours. You're going to be wasting your time. That's not even it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I don't want to waste my time. This is the problem right here. This is the problem. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Well, I am the counselor. Can I do some counseling? Can I release the inward counsel in you so you don't have to invent stuff and spin your wheels and get frustrated? Ask yourself, where are the areas in your life you are the most frustrated and stagnant? And I'll challenge you to have a little more respect for gifts, regardless to what you understand, and see what the Holy Spirit will do when he renovates and tear down your thinking and builds himself a home in, your, in the house of your body. Changes your mind. architecture. Literally, it says, he who prays in this releases the blueprints, the architecture, the floor plans of a house and a sanctum and a temple that my spirit wants to build inside of you so that you make it more of a home. And then John 15, 7, it becomes interesting because it said, he who abides in me and my word abides in him. The word abide means, doesn't mean just lives. It means that you make me feel at home. So the qualification is not just you're saved. That's what you think John 15, 7 is saying. No, he said, if you make me feel at home in you, and you feel at home in me, then you will ask what you will. Get mad at Jesus. He didn't say ask, hold on, wait a Ask what you desire. What did he do when he appeared to Solomon, when he approached him the correct way? He said, whatever you ask, whatever you desire, ask of me. Then what's so amazing about the gracious givingness of God, he said, just give me wisdom. He said, I knew he was going to ask me for wisdom. Not only am I going to give you wisdom, but I know you had some other desires tucked back there, and I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to cause your enemies to be at peace with you. We ain't been reading the Bible right. We have misconstrued the loving, generous nature of God who brokers his power to his people. He ain't stingy with it. Just give him back the glory and make sure you are lifting his son and not yourself. Now, let's finish here because we we don't wait. Let's go to the next one. Time escaped me. Remember when I took you to 2 Timothy 1.6? How we showed you in the Greek that he says, stir up the gift. And that word literally means the charismata, how the only gift you can stir at will is your ability to pray in your heavenly prayer language. No, no, no. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now, look at verse 14. Look what he says here as well. The other one was, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, notice now what he already said that was, it was not a language to human beings of earthly origin. You can keep putting that in every time you see it. Not a human language to any human being. Now, look what he says. My spirit by the Holy Spirit within me, what? But my mind is what? It bears no fruit and helps nobody. Once again, God is leaving the mind part out of the secret council, and he wants the Holy Spirit to communicate with you spirit to spirit. Then the word of God becomes the firewall that keeps you from being deceived when you think you hear the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will never contradict the Word of God. Say, the Word of God is the will of God. If it's not in the Word of God, it's not in the will of God. It becomes an antiviral system in a supernatural unseen world of spirit beings who all want to be God. See why you can't play around when he says, listen, I can't just save you. I got to dip you. I got to insulate you. I got to initiate you. I got to cover you because there's an unseen world that you're walking in. 
I'm going to say this to you. We recently had a, a terrible incident happen with a submarine. And that submarine, it was a bunch of, of entrepreneurs, people who really did, who were marginally experienced, really, in diving to those depths. And when you really look at all the facts, even the material of the submarine was not the correct material for depth. Even they were saying that when a submersible goes to a certain depth and comes back up, it has a lifespan before the pressure just will continually cause it to implode or crush. And the Spirit of God spoke to me. Whew. And listen to this. He said, we had these intrepid, inexperienced explorers who were excited about delving the depths of another world. But they didn't take time to respect the laws of that realm and that world. The atmosphere above and the atmosphere below, those are two different worlds. That's why the Bible uses the word baptism. Because baptism means you are leaving a whole nother world of existence and being immersed into another. So this is why baptism is synonymous with the Christian life. We think it's just to say only that Jesus is Lord. That's a portion. Really, the word baptism, when you study the use of it in secular Roman Greco culture, was to be initiated into battle for public representation and service. So we think it's just to tell everybody in the room who are already Christians, I'm saved. That's diluted. It was to be immersed and enlisted for battle. That's why baptism is necessary for every Christian. Not to just say, Jesus, Lord, because we often do it in front of Christians. That is false. Water baptism is to say, not only am I a son, but I am enlisting in the army of God today. And I have been, and as much as I am leaving one realm, I am immersing myself in another. And the water is to be a symbol of how much you need Jesus to be your baptizer. Not merely in physical water, but in a supernatural fire that insulates you from the dark realm. It is a mark that says, this one's mine. How do you know? When Jesus got baptized, what happened? The heavens were open and a supernatural event occurred. This is my beloved son. It's the same thing that happens in the spirit realm for every son or daughter who's not merely baptized in physical water. Listen to me. But when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the heavens open over your life. There is an annunciation over your identity. There is an increase in empowerment. And God says, now come try him and see what happens to you. Oh, my God. How do we know that? Because right after the Bible says, and the Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. God was saying, come try my boy. Do what you, say what you want to say and do what you want to do. He's ready. Well, that's just for Jesus. And that's what religious morons tell you. They want to tell you, you want to be capital G-O-D. You're God. When you say, I want to be like my Savior. I want to, I want to do, and he's the one who leaves you the example and tells you to do what he does. But the minute you want to do what he does, because they don't walk in any power, and they don't teach it, and it's awkward for them because people see it in the Bible, but they don't really explain it, they got to say it's either of the devil or it's passed away. How convenient. It's of the devil or it's passed away. Christians, I'm challenging you because the Lord's telling me in our church, I don't care who criticizes this church. I don't care what they say. If you will hold to the word of God, hold to the person, the process, the pattern of empowerment, you will begin to see the intervention of the Holy Spirit in your life like you have never seen. Your motive must be pure to love him and to love people. Now, here's what happened. The Lord told me the same way. Now, notice the two experiences we were, we've been teaching in the Bible is the anointing within. That's when the Holy Spirit as a person comes in at the point, at the point of salvation. Yes, you can experience the fruit of the Spirit, the character. I often say the fruit of the Spirit is the character of Jesus. But then that we have taught you, without question, there's a second experience, the anointing upon. Now watch this. 
The anointing within deals with internal pressure. That's why it, the focus is not just merely the supernatural. It deals with you dealing with temptation, dealing with inward pressure. How many of you, when you're tempted, you're tempted from yourself internally, and you're also tempted externally by things you encounter or you see? So, the anointing upon comes to supernaturalize you. It brings the miraculous. It brings supernatural supplementation. It brings a supernatural ability so that you just don't have the character of Jesus, but you're able to reproduce the power of Jesus because you represent him, not you. Now, in this analogy, the Lord says, if you don't know this with scuba, the laws of the ocean, if you descend too quick, you will implode if you don't have the infrastructure If you don't have the building, you don't have the architecture that can sustain the pressure within. In scuba and in the laws of, of the ocean, if you ascend too quickly, you go up too fast, and you don't have the infrastructure, and you don't have the building, the pressure will cause you to explode, deeper implode, too fast up, explode. That's the law of the world of water. You cannot survive in this evil, decrepit culture with only the anointing within. You can only go so deep, and you can only go so high. But the anointing upon helps you deal with the external pressures of demons and disease and unclean and all kind of manner of wickedness that is often very supernatural. So in that environment, they have to pressurize internally and pressurize externally. If that pressure is not equal, there's either explosions or implosions. It's the same for your spiritual character. And the Lord told me, he said, we have, I have too many in the body who love the supernatural, who want to be intrepid explorers of another realm, but they don't respect the laws of the spiritual realm. And then can't even begin to move into supernatural because they won't even accept what I said about what facilitates the inward infrastructure. That pressurizes you not only with your character, but to not be corrupted by dark power, but by my spirit. So I want to challenge you today as we close here in a moment. You need the anointing within that comes in salvation. And many have received that all over the body of Christ. But you need the anointing upon because Jesus doesn't want you to just exhibit his character. He wants you to exhibit his power. And it just shook me because when the Lord showed me, I was in a cab in, in Washington, D.C., and the Lord just dropped it in me. They didn't have the structure. They didn't have the architecture. They had the excitement. They had the desire. They were not afraid to step out. You know how fearless you got to be? Like, man, did, you know how excited you got to be that you don't? That's like being excited to get on a roller coaster and forget to buckle up. I want you to see that God created you, and you really don't have a choice from what I study in that Bible to be supernatural. You don't have a choice. You can believe you, don't have, a, you have a choice, but commands are not suggestions, which means that as we start dealing with demonic manifestation more and more, and we start dealing with so-called beings from the skies and all kind of things you'll see on TV and apparitions and stuff that will make... Jesus said, will make men's hearts melt for fear. If you are not insulated and you stop fighting this gift, you stop being afraid and being ashamed to receive the second experience. You learn how not just to get somebody saved, but to get them filled. And you learn that you must facilitate your own infrastructure by praying and edifying yourself. And by doing that, there is more power because there has been an obedience in the place of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. 
See, that's when the Lord will say, I trust you. I'm going to send you to heads of state. I'm going to send you into a realm where I would not send an uninitiated believer. They may not come out alive. But I'm going to send you because you have built. (laughs) We'll pick up next week. But I I know (laughs) I've been stuck here for like two weeks. Because we've been talking about how the second is, is the way you give a message to a congregation. The third was supernaturally the ability to share in known languages. We see that happening in one degree in Acts 2. And one, the fourth one was the ability to interpret. You can't just force an interpretation. That's a gift God will give people that they will hear and understand the heart and the mind of the Spirit when God is speaking to a congregation, not just in a known prophecy. See, prophecy is speaking in a known language to a a group or a person. But tongues and interpretation is God speaking in another language to an assembly or congregation, and then he will allow someone to interpret that. And I said, Lord, why if we have prophecy, we even need that? The Lord said, because I'm constantly reminding you I'm not human. Constantly reminding you that I'm from another dimension and another world, and no language you have and no culture you have compares to the culture of my kingdom. I want you to stand to your feet in Jesus' name. I'm very excited because I've been wanting to teach some of these deeper things for a while, and the Lord has released me. That means you guys are, he deems you able to maturely hear it, understand it, and begin to move in it. Now, very quickly, if you're in this room, very, very quickly, were y'all blessed today?